Nicole Gibson's my younger brother. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you, Lisa, for organising today. Um, I think it's really exciting and um, it's particularly good to be um, following Lisa Atkins and um, some of what I've got to say will sort of overlap, but uh, I think you've set a great platform. So, <clears throat> this presentation sort of is a, a synthesis of a couple of papers we've been doing. And I guess the, the overriding theme that we're trying to address is that both for heterodox economics and I guess for our particular concern, Marxism, it, it's had problems approaching finance and class. Generally, and it's probably been adequate for a while, finance has generally been seen in distributional terms, in terms of class. You know, finance extracts its share of, of surplus value from the real economy. We can leave it at that. Or, in more sort of working class terms, we can say that um, finance extracts value out of labour via interest payments. Our proposition, however, and, and by the way, you can see this um, appearing as a part of the most recent analysis of finance in class two. Now, Costas Lapovitz's work um, on financial appropriation or expropriation of labour, and even in the Bill Lazonic and others' work on um, shareholder value, all of them are essentially, in a sense, uh, pushing at the distributional role of finance. But as Lisa has laid out, there is another alternative and another trajectory. It just doesn't happen to be in heterodox or Marxist economics very much. Um, so my, our work here really has been inspired by some feminist economists, some development economists who've looked at household production um, of peasant agriculture, um, sociologists like Lisa herself, and particularly even cultural studies people like Randy Martin, Fred Jamison, Hart and Negri, and this is going to be a bit controversial. <coughs> I guess we've also, from, from the dark side, also been really interested in the work of people like Robert Schiller. And I'll say a little bit more about him later. I guess the project then of, that we've been trying to work on is to show how the frontiers of capital's engagement with labour is moving outside of the factory and it's moving outside the factory, but still in circuits of production and circulation. And in doing so, I guess, um, Dick touched on this a bit earlier today, we're going to notice that a lot of the old categories um, are blurry. The distinction between production and consumption, I think, has become less than useful. The distinction between finance and industry is also uh, a question that's become less and less useful. Work and leisure, uh, the worker, consumer, investor, all of these categories now need to be rethought in the wake of developments in finance. So what's the sort of path that we want to develop as a way of rethinking this? Well, a provocative um, and, and somewhat ironic um, way we're going to try to develop this is by thinking and framing workers and, and their household in particular as an asset class. Now that might sound a bit, a bit silly. We're not talking about them as an asset-owning class here, but a class of assets in which capital invests. And the point here, to put it rather crudely or to sort of make the argument as clear as possible up front, is that a lot of risks that used to be shared through the state or with employers have been pushed down onto labour, um, at, both through the labour market and by privatisation and so on. And these, these, this shifting of risks has meant that the household is now at the centre of financial risk management. Households have to manage a whole range of risks that they didn't 20 years ago, whether it's saving for retirement, paying for education, taking out healthcare insurance, paying for infrastructure, utilities and so on. In some ways, this new risk management role for households then um, is akin to becoming hedge funds of their own life course. So while many people have focused on household debt as the key engagement with finance, we've also been seeing financial markets developing a vast range of products to facilitate the risk transfers that I've been talking about. And contrary to the idea you know, that high finance has nothing to do with households, we, our argument would be that households have actually been at the centre of the last 20 years of financial innovation in many ways. 
because as these risk shiftings occurred, we've seen a whole new suite of financial products and a whole regulatory and cultural project to normalise and stabilise <coughs> So, for instance, before the global financial crisis, um, a number of people were recognising this new role for households in finance. Robert Schiller, for instance, in um, a book in 2003, wrote that households were far more important than stock markets because that's where the vast majority of our wealth is. And he also said that's where financial markets were heading to get engagement with that, with, with that wealth. Indeed, with Robert Schiller, as Dick has said somewhere else, Robert Schiller didn't just predict the future, he'd been patenting it. You can now buy K. Schiller house price indices for many of the regions across the US, and um, I'm sure once the price, in the price series is available in Australia, you'll start to see the same sort of things before. And just so that uh, we don't focus on you know, a behavioural economist, in 2006, just before the um, GFC, the IMF <coughs> in their financial stability report famously said that there'd been a transfer of risk from financial markets to households and they thought that this risk was fantastic because it had diversified the risks and made the system more stable. Now of course they made the call right that it was that there had been the risk transfer but they had underestimated the stability implications. But we'll come back to the post-GFC project of that in a minute. So this, the central part of this risk shifting and the growth of finance is the process of securitisation. Lisa's already touched on it a little bit. Um, the key part about these is that a whole stream of payments centred around debt but increasingly around a whole range of fixed commitments that have debt-like characteristics but more importantly are fixed. That's the key point, is that they don't have to be called a debt. In utility payments and all sorts of other things are perfectly securitizable as long as they're regular. So simply frame, an increasing range of household payments, loan, debts, and these other fixed payments we've been talking about, are being bundled up into income streams and sold into financial markets. Mortgage-backed securities, of course, are the most famous, but auto loans, credit card debt, student loans, utility payments are also emerging as areas of growth of securitisation markets. Now, the GFC, of course, showed that the geometric expansion of, high, of household risks and fixed financial commitment were a disaster. Ha households in the US defaulted and crashed the US and then the global financial system. So how do we deal with that? Does that show that this project of financialisation is finished? Is it a sort of um, a, a temporary blip and we'll go back to some sort of normality? I guess five years on we're able to make a bit stronger a call. Perhaps we can say that, or frame this extension of risks and costs in the way it happened as toxic, but also as a form of primitive accumulation or of absolute surplus value extraction. It was about increasing the absolute risk and financial commitments of households, often quite literally beyond breaking point. So here's the inherent problem then with financialization its instability. So financial markets want, want um, <coughs> regular payment streams um, to bundle up into securities, but this risk shifting um, created an unstable household sector. So the project, I guess, that we would nominate for capital in the wake of the GFC is normalising those household income streams making households, if you like, safe for capitalism. A couple of indications of this. Since the GFC, and um, especially since Obama came to power, um, we've seen a number of things. They have what's called a National Financial Literacy Week every year. Now, at the launch of the first one, he said something like, look, um, obviously the, the, this financial crisis was the product of banks lending to people that they shouldn't have but it was also the product of people taking on commitments that they knew they, they couldn't make. The resolution then was to make households aware of the sort of financial commitments that they had and make them and give them education so they know how to behave and how much risk to take on. Let me just read you a little thing. 
So that's one side of that, that regulatory response. And um, we'll also note that the US Federal Reserve has now has a project of mod modelling US household balance sheets. Um, I think it's the Federal Reserve of Kansas now has a, a centre for household financial stability. And you'll see a lot of reports around the US Fed saying that they've now realised that the household sector is at the centre of financial stability. And the project, rather than to take households out of finance, financial stability is not about abstinence from finance, it's about the ongoing stabilisation of households and finance. So these strategic initiatives, in a sense, you could think of them then as about the project of real subsumption of labour to finance. <clears throat> and there's two dimensions to that project. The first one that I've said, which is to make households reliable payers who will prioritise their regular fixed commitments over and above anything else to make sure that they don't default. So financial literacy programs like the Obama Initiative are now quite pervasive. You can see them in the OECD, in Britain, you can see them here. Um, these are sort of, and remember, these are highly moralised stories about how it's so important that you um, make sure you make those payments, and of course, if you don't, it must be your fault. In a review of bankruptcy law, um, US bankruptcy law before the GFC, um, some of that moralism uh, came flying through. I think Hank Paulson um, called people that, that uh, default on their mortgages mere speculators. Um, Alan Greenspan said that the rise in US bankruptcy um, <coughs> was a signal that, that Americans had lost their sense of moral shame. Um, perhaps the best one um, that I liked was that the, the bankruptcy report itself made the analogy between becoming bankrupt, the decision to become bankrupt, and shoplifting. So in other words, uh, shop stealing is the moral equivalent of, of becoming um, a defaulter. So that's one side, which is normalising household engagement with finance. And it's absolutely clear, I think, that you know, five years after the GFC, that, that this project of, ex of expanded accumulation in our households um, is, is continuing. But there's also another project for capital, and this is part of that modelling of household balance sheets and so on. We see this also in you know, major developments in financial markets in attempts to measure the possibilities of default for households. And the key here is to try and calibrate precisely the risk of default over a range of different types of financial commitments. Because Pricing that risk is integral to securitisation. Securitisation only really works when those payment streams can be calibrated for their risk return characteristics. So paradoxically, in trying to work out how risky households are, finance has become at the centre of measuring poverty because responsible lending now is that you can that, that you would lend enough so that you soak up everything, every possible source of payment except what's absolutely necessary to survive on. So measuring poverty is now a central project for finance and financial markets. So we've got then central banks monitoring household balance sheets. Even the notion of a household as a balance sheet you know, shows you how far we've come down the process of financialisation. And finance then measuring the capacity of different households under different conditions to continue to meet those payments. So what are the political implications potentially for this move? I think the first one that, that Lisa's already started to flag is that we need to start thinking much more expansively about the capital labour relation. Wage labour as the sort of central arc or anchor for class analysis has to be rethought because the household now in sort of forms that we never thought of before are now producing value which is becoming securitised. Um, you know, Dick even mentioned that um, producing use values like communicating on Facebook now 
a part of the securitisation market. And I think it's important that we just be open, a lot more open than, than a lot of heterodox economists have been, to think about how value is created <coughs> in a financialised economy. So the stylized factory, I think, just doesn't get us there. And how we think about the household um, differently will be, I think, a real test of how, how much heterodox economics can renew itself. And I think politically then, if Labor's households are now a key to financial stability, we, we can see a different sort of potency. Of course, we saw that potency only in the negative in the GFC, in its, in it, once it found itself unable to pay back mortgages, um, it collapsed the financial system. But the whole um, anchor of the financial system now is on liquidity provided out of households. And that's, that's a certain potency that we could could consider and think about. Um, at the very least, then, it identifies these some of these sort of spontaneous acts like strike debt as interesting experiments in different types of resistance to capital. Um, perhaps I'll end there and we can pick up some of the other things at the end. Thank you.